great project, a great program to open up the development of a stellar canoe route experience in the Wabakimi uh, area, Wabakimi Provincial Park, surrounding provincial parks, and uh, Crownlands. So uh, I've spent a whole week here. Um, it's been a great experience, and I hope to come uh, back. Uh, Phil, where is Wabakimi? 150 miles straight north of Thunder Bay, Ontario. Thunder Bay, Ontario is on the west shore of Lake Superior. And what is the what is the Wabakimi Provincial Park? It's uh, the second largest park, provincial park in Ontario after Polar Bear, which is way up on Hudson Bay. Um, it's almost all wilderness, no roads. Uh, as a matter of fact, very few roads to even reach it. And it's so large that you could put Quetico and Woodland Caribou inside its boundaries. And um, I understand that it's surrounded by other provincial parks and crown lands. Yes. Um, provincial parks are protected areas, no mining, no development. Uh, crown land or public land is uh, open to development. Uh, resource harvesting, timber, mining, uh, even hydroelectric development, and needless to say, roads. Uh, one of our concerns is not just uh, in the Wabakini project, are not just the values that lie within the park and the surrounding parks, but the values that lie on the crown lands. And that's especially important, I understand, uh, because there's very little direct access to Wabakimi Provincial Park itself. That's correct. You have to actually, from the limits of road access, paddle across the Crown Lands to reach the park boundary and enjoy the canoe roads that are inside. Oh, I guess one, one exception may be, if it is an exception, is that the Canadian National Railway uh, goes right along the southern uh, boundary of the park. Right. right it actually uh, transects the park. It doesn't go out, it's not outside the park, it goes right through the park. Um, it's sometimes known as the uh, Northern Transcontinental Line because there is another rail line further south. Uh, Phil, uh, can you tell me why Wabakimi Park was created? In 1983, uh, the original, what we now call the core area of the park, was created to protect the last existing herd of woodland caribou. However, in 97, they realized that the herd migrated much further annually than had been anticipated, and the park was expanded sixfold to its present size. Do we have any idea how, how many woodland caribou there might be in the general area? Between 280 and 380 adults, and the number does go up and down with winter kill. Uh, and it, of course, the numbers themselves are subject to the accuracy of the annual winter aerial survey. If they don't see the caribou, then their calculations may be low. Why do they put so much value on the on the woodland caribou? It's a uh, protected species. Is it an indicator species of the health of the ecosystem? I think it is, yes, very much so, especially in the boreal forest, since unlike the moose, which can live in other ecosystems, uh, the caribou rely on the mosses and the lichens, which only grow in the uh, boreal forest or further north. Uh, from my tromping around in the in the forest this last uh, week, I noticed there was a tremendous amount of uh, of moss and, and lichens growing. Very, very lush, very rich yes, environment. The, the white, uh, that's the best I can describe it, the white one, uh, its Latin name actually has the word reindeer in it, uh, is not a moss but a lichen, and it's the main staple food in the winter time and what happens is the caribou paw the snow away to find it. Now, how anybody can <laughs> insist on that, I don't know, but they do. What were the other reasons the park was created? Well, there was a, a movement afoot by our provincial government back in the 
to set aside 12% of the province's land base as protected areas that would not be developed for any reason. And Wabakimi got swept up and created as part of that urgency. We've not made the 12%, by the way. We're somewhere between 85 and 10 so they're still working on it. Phil is a first-time participant in the, in the Wabakini project. I had the opportunity to go out this last week and uh, uh, tromp around in the woods and canoe with uh, some really fine people uh, looking for portages, uh, improving portages, and uh, identifying uh, campsites and, and generally surveying uh, uh, some interesting uh, canoe routes. Um, tell me about the, the Wabakini project. Uh, uh, its its mission and its objective. Our objective, in order to protect and preserve all of the traditional and historically significant canoe roads in that area, is first to find them, to document them, and uh, as you said, to rehabilitate them if they have fallen into disrepair through natural means, of course, flow down, forest fire, whatever. Uh, to date. We've documented 4,500 kilometers of canoe roads, over 800, uh, almost 900 portages, almost 900 campsites, and the total distance of the portages added all together is about uh, 150 miles of portage. So, so from my experience this last week, uh, Rebuilding a portage means 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 walking. Number one, finding it. Yes. Walking it, and oftentimes you're going from blaze to blaze, and the blaze a blaze is the cu a cut cut mark on the tree, probably on both sides of the tree, and and then uh, some of us have Sierra saws, and we're sawing the willows away, and and the Labrador tea. and then there's one guy with the chaps on and a and a big helmet with a chainsaw. And he's whacking down all the blowdown that's in front of us, and somebody's behind him tossing it off the trail, yeah. or over mossy, wet parts, creating corduroy yeah. uh, logs to, to to step on. So that's it's it's quite a strenuous process. I it I is. discovered it is yes. Phil, why is it so important to to document the the historic uh, canoe routes uh, and portages in, in the Wabakini Park and the surrounding areas. The park is currently not, doesn't have uh, a defined management plan, even though it's been 30 years, some 30 years, for different reasons. But uh, most importantly, when it comes to inventorying, the historical, natural, and cultural values of the park, canoe roads are high on the list as to what values need to be protected. The problem is the government does not have a complete inventory of the canoe roads. So the rehabilitation of them is just part of it. The, the actual thrust of our effort is to identify them and make sure that the inventory is complete before the park management plan is inked. And then, so by documenting these canoe routes, there's there's a, an argument against clear cutting uh, and logging uh, an identified area On and protecting protecting other values. Yeah, so we need people to come to use these canoe routes uh, just through their use. They'll stay open, and we won't have to go through this whole process again. But as to the vision. There's no doubt in my mind that this is the largest roadless wilderness area left in North America that has that many miles of canoe roads. Uh, probably in, in the area that we've defined as the Wabakimi area, something in the order of four to four and a half thousand miles of canoe roads. We have a great working relationship with uh, what we call the paper companies because mm -hmm. primarily timber harvested out of this part of the world goes to uh, paper mills to make all sorts of paper. Um, we have a good re working relationship with them 
And over the past 12 years, we've managed to negotiate with most of the different companies improved prescriptions for the protection of campsites, a no-cut buffer for 200 meters in a semicircle around the campsite from shore to shore, and in the case of portages, a minimum of a 30 meter buffer on each, no no cut buffer on each side of the trail, often backed by another 30 meters where they're not allowed to build roads, but they can harvest the trees only if they skid them out of that area away from the portage, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And it's been very, very successful, very successful indeed. It's undeveloped, that's what it is. Uh -huh. I wonder if you could imagine the boundary waters without the towns of Ely and Grand Marais right. and the road access to those towns. I've used both extensively. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the boundary waters would be something that's out there that, well, how do I get to it? And that's, right now, that's the case. You have, uh, the closest communities are uh, Armstrong and Savant Lake, both of which lie well outside uh, the park itself. Um, and you only have three means of uh, accessing the canoe routes in that area. You can drive to certain launch points. There's the rail that we mentioned earlier, and you mentioned float plane, and, and that's it. And uh, I mentioned those in the order of their expense as well. So a lot of the current use of the interior of the park is for people working with outfitters who fly into outpost cabins. Yes, very much so. Um, but it's, it's growing, albeit slowly. Uh, the maps that we have developed are helping educate the public, the canoeing public, as to what's available, and, and that's really good. And, and so I guess what you might say is that when civilization arrives, there is an impact, right. and a long-standing uh, impact. And since the caribou eat those mosses, once you destroy the moss, Ecos the moss and lichen ecosystem, you're, de de you're debilitating the ability Absolutely. of the woodland caribou to survive. Even more so, before right. you get to their food supply, caribou are very, very shy animals, unlike moose. Uh -huh. uh, and any noise, any noise that's not natural, such as machinery, mm -hmm. will drive them away, away from their own food supply even. And uh, they did an interesting test where they sent several of our conservation officers into an area where they knew there were caribou. And using radios to communicate, one of them fired a gun off while the others watched. And within a five mile area, every caribou left. And all it was was one shot with a 30. Uh, Phil, when we were out uh, in the Crownlands bush area, we encountered some posts with mining claims, mm -hmm. uh, metal... Uh, Lic licensed prospectors uh, are allowed on the Crown or public lands to uh, prospect and to lay claim, uh, the usual four posts and a description, etc. And uh, we actually, our government maintains an interactive website where new claims that have been filed uh, are up on the internet within 24 hours. And so you can actually see where the claims are and who owns them. How, so how long can they keep, is a claim good for? Uh, Do you a have claim idea? is only valid on an annual basis, providing the uh, holder of the claim invests so much work into the money, work, labor, development. If they just claim it and then sit on it, sorry, you're going to lose it at the end of the year. Phil, how can people get involved with the project or Friends of Wabakimi? Very simple answer. Go to the website. Look up uh, the Wabakimi project or look up Friends of Wabakimi. We also have a Facebook page for the Friends of. All the information a prospective participant needs is there. I've done many uh, Boundary Waters canoe trips and several Quetico canoe trips, and I was always curious about what was further north 
uh, in the country. What do, what's north of Quetico to go canoeing in? And by searching online and the web, I found uh, uh, this area called uh, Wabakimi Provincial Park, and then I found the website for the Wabakimi Project, and found some videos online on YouTube, which I watched. And through that whole process, I made contact with um, with Phil. Uh, Cotton at the Wabakimi project and he emailed me back and I went through a process of filling out an application and a bunch of information and signed up to go out on a work party trip uh, this uh, first week of June in 2015 and uh, worked on identifying portages and campsites and clearing portages and working on developing uh, some canoe routes, identifying canoe routes in some crown lands, which are uh, one of the ways you access the Wabakimi Provincial Park. Uh, this was a very um, interesting and strenuous experience. Uh, it was a very good uh, experience, and I would certainly encourage anybody who is interested in knowing more about uh, Wabakimi Provincial Park and its surrounding areas to look at the website information and the Facebook page information for Friends of Wabakimi, the new nonprofit organization, and the other information online uh, about the Wabakimi project. Phil, when I was uh, in the bush and in near a little lake, what uh, we thought was a, an old uh, moose camp, I found uh, this conical uh, birch bark, woven birch bark device just lying in the ground about one third of it into the leaves and grass. It looked like it'd been there for a while. Can you tell us what this is? This is a moose cull that's uh, handmade out of birch bark. Uh, I'm not sure about the material that it was sewn together with, but it looks like dried uh, root tendrils, not uh, animal material like sinew. Uh, and very simply, uh, it's a megaphone. That's basically it. Okay. Do you have any idea how old this might be? <laughs> it's in mint condition. I would say less than 10 years. Be being made of natural products, it would have deteriorated sooner. Uh, possibly only a couple of years old, but... Uh, made in the, uh, you might call it the traditional manner. Right. I would therefore suggest it was probably made by local residents of the Armstrong area from the native community of White Sand. Uh, and, and this is Ojibwe community? Oh yes, absolutely. Okay, so authentic. Or Chippewa, uh, which, which mm. are sort of a, a, the distant cousins down in the Wisconsin I area, okay. if you will. Well, Phil, thank you very much uh, for your hospitality and allowing me the opportunity to be part of the project. I really appreciate it. No problem at all. That's what we're here for. All right. Thank you.